الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We begin a new chapter in our book عمدة الأحكام but also related to purity and tahara and this chapter deals with menstruation and we all know that menstruation only happens to females and it is something that Allah Azza wa Jal has created so don't ask for equality and say why do only women get this I'd like to have a portion of that and when women come and say we're equal no you're not you can conceive children I can't so Allah created men and women and Allah who knows whom he created gave all certain rules and regulations they all must follow. We have a hadith with us, hadith of Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. And who will uh, read that for us? Yes, brother. Narrated Aisha, Fatima bint Abi Hubesh came to the Prophet and said, I am a woman whose blood keeps flowing and never purified. Should I therefore abandon prayer? He said, not at all, for this is only a way. So leave prayer as much as the days you used to have your regular menses and then make ghusl and pray. In another narration, this is not menstruation. Therefore, don't pray. Once its time is gone, wash the blood and pray. Okay. The issue of menstruation is a topic among the most difficult topics in the books of fiqh. And if you go and read books of fiqh, you'll find great number of pages written on it though it's very simple it should be very simple because Allah Azza wa Jal has created women on this way the majority of women have a certain period of the month where they get this blood this blood comes out only when they're not pregnant because this blood is made to feed the fetus in their wombs so if it's, they're not pregnant, this blood comes out. Once they're pregnant, all of this blood goes to feed the child all, the whole nine months while he or it is in the womb. Now, it is very simple. When the women get their menstruation, they stop their prayer and fasting. When they're purified, they resume their normal lives. But if the bleeding is continuous throughout the whole month, then we have to judge this to be an istihada. And what is istihada? It is a continuation of the blood that makes it difficult, if not impossible, to recognize what is menses and what is not. And this is why Fatima bint Abi Hubaysh, one of the companions, came and complained to the Prophet ﷺ that she keeps on bleeding the whole year. It never stops. And she wasn't the only one. The scholars say that there were 19 female companions who had the istihada, this continuous blood. So the Prophet said, ﷺ, this is not your menses. This is a vein, meaning that this is an illness that causes the blood to continue to come out throughout the whole month or most of the time. So what to do? The Prophet told her alayhi salatu wasalam, you have to leave prayer similar amount of the days that you get your menses. Before you got this bleeding, did you have normal menses? She said, yes, six to seven days every month. So the Prophet told her, leave these days every month and then take a shower take a ghusl and pray and fast regularly even if the blood is coming out and consider the blood that's coming out other than the period we consider as menses to be a blood of vein all what you have to do is wash it and perform wudu for every salah now this is one hadith there are other hadiths such as the hadith of Aisha number 42, I think it's a, a second hadith. 
Okay, we need someone to read it for us. Yes, uh, Abdurrahman. Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, may peace be upon him, narrated that Umm Habiba suffered from prolonged bleeding, al istihada, between the monthly menses period for seven years. She asked Allah's Apostle about it. He ordered her to take a bath after the termination of the actual periods and added that it was from a blood vessel. So, she used to take a bath for every prayer. Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, may peace be upon him, said, Umm Habiba bin Tajash, the spouse of Abdurrahman bin Auf, made a complaint to the Messenger of Allah, may peace be upon him, about blood, which flows beyond the menstrual period. He said to her, Remain away from prayer equal to the length of time that your menstruation holds you back. After this, bathe yourself. And she used to take a bath for every prayer. Very well. Now, the first hadith was explained to us by the second hadith. Because Umm Habiba, anyone would have thought that this was the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. There was a, there is, right? What's her name? Umm Habiba. Who is she? Bint Abi Sufyan. Ramla. Bint Abi Sufyan. The mother of the believers. Now this Umm Habiba is Umm Habiba bin Jahsh. She is a companion of the Prophet ﷺ. And she is the wife of Abdurrahman ibn Auf. And the sister-in-law of the Prophet. Because Umm Habiba bin Jahsh. Zainab bin Jahsh. Hamna bin Jahsh. They were three sisters. And the three of them were the cousins of the Prophet ﷺ. Their mother is the maternal aunt of the Prophet ﷺ. So she complained of the same issue of menses. Being so prolonged that over the past seven years, it never stopped. And the Prophet told her ﷺ to bathe. She, from herself, used to bathe for every salah. And the scholars say that this is not mandatory at all to bathe for every salah because the Prophet ordered her only to, to bathe once and that is when she believes and thinks that her menses is over. From these two hadiths, we have another five or six or seven different hadiths but they're not mentioned in this book. Why? Because this is a concise Summary, it is not as long as Bulugh al-Maram, for example. And it is not as long as uh, Nail al-Awtar or al-Muntaqa, which is the origin is al-Muntaqa. So, how to deal in the case of a woman who has istihada, which is not a general thing to have. The general and the normal thing is to have height, which is the menses. A woman gets usually her menses, six days, seven days, nine days, 12 days, a month. There is no minimum. Some scholars say that the minimum period of hayat is one day. If it's less than a day, then it's not. And this is not acceptable. A woman may get her menses 12 hours a month. This is how Allah created her. Why do you say, no, this is not allowed? And they say the maximum can reach up to 15 days. And again, scholars say, why? If a woman gets her monthly period 17 days every month, fixed, how do I say that, no, 15 days, after one hour, this becomes a stihada? There is no evidence on that. So it depends on her period, how it is. Now, if the blood does not stop at all. If it continues to flow, then this woman, we consider her to be in the state of istihada. So now, how can we differentiate when to pray and when not to pray? There are three stages. Stage one, what was mentioned in the hadith of Fatima bint Abi Hubaysh and the hadith of Umm Habiba bint Jahsh. And that is, you should stop praying the days your menses used to come. Meaning, stage one is related to women who know the length of their period and when to start. So, 
usually a woman stays 10 years. And during these 10 years, every lunar month, from the first day till the seventh, she gets her menses. She knows that seven days in the beginning of every lunar month. For 10 years, she's been like this. And all of a sudden, it shifted. Halas. She started getting the bleeding every single day, either because she took contraceptives, either because she had an operation, for some reason or the other. Now she's complaining. She says, Sheikh, I have my whole month. The bleeding is continuous. What to do? What do I say to her? What do I tell her? I tell her, your previous menses, do you know the duration and the time? She says, yes. I say, every lunar month from day one till day seven, you do not pray and you do not fast. On the seventh day, you make ghusl, you start to pray and fast and act normally. And disregard the blood to be istihada. Regard it as istihada. Understood? Anyone has any questions? Okay, we have a break. After the break, inshallah, I will take your questions, so stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. So, stage one is understood. If the woman comes to me and says, Sheikh, I did have a fixed period of menses, but I forgot how long. I'm not sure if it's six or seven, and I'm not sure if it's in the beginning or the middle or in the end. In this case, if she knows the period, six, seven days, we tell her, okay, the seven days, you always do it from the first of the month. Regardless, whether you had it in the middle or at the end, consider it to be from the beginning of the month. If she says, I don't know how many days, and I don't know when, in this case, we go to stage two. And stage two is to identify through observation. And what does that mean? Scholars say that the blood of menses and the blood of a vein or normal blood differ. One, the blood of the menses is darker. It's almost black. And the blood of the vein is red. Two, the blood of the menses smells, has a bad smell. The normal blood has no smell unless you're a werewolf. Three, the blood of the menses usually comes but accompanied with aches in the back and in the stomach while the normal bleeding does not have these characteristics. And finally, for the blood of the menses, I don't know what is the medical term for it. If a person bleeds, the blood would turn into clot. But the blood of the menses does never ever turn into clot. It keeps on being in the state of fluid. So I don't know what is the medical term for that, but you know what I mean, inshallah. So these are the four differences, and that is why scholars say, if a woman does not know the length of her period or when it begins, she is instructed to observe. If she notices that the color has changed and the aches are there, we tell her, khalas, this is the beginning of your menses. Once the color changed back into lighter and no smell and she has no pains, we tell her, take your bath and consider the rest to be the bleeding of a vein. Understood, inshallah, stage two. Move on to stage three. If a woman says the whole blood looks alike and I don't have aches or I'm always in ache and pain the whole month and I'm unable to differentiate what to do. In this case, the scholars say she has to follow her sisters, her aunts, her mother, because usually in the same family, those who have sisters, they notice that Two or three of the sisters have their menses at the same time. Sometimes the whole, the whole ladies, the mother maybe as well. So in this case, she is told to take or follow suit. When both of her sisters or her mother and sister have their periods, she consider herself to be with them. Once they are purified, she considered herself to be purified. She take a ghusl and that would end her menses. Now, how does a woman know if she's purified or not? There is what is known as the white discharge. 
a thread, white thread-like discharge that women generally get. After the menses is over, they have or they see or they detect this white thread-like discharge. And some part of the women don't have this, yet they know it through what is known as dryness. Once her menses is over, I'm not talking about istihad now. I'm talking about the regular menses of seven days or eight days. How would she know that she is purified and she can take ghusl and pray? By either seeing the white thread-like discharge, or if she does not get this, by the purity and the dryness, the complete dryness, where she does not see any traces or yellowish or brownish color at all. So this, inshallah, is as a summary, what is regarded to be uh, related to the menstruation and to the field of istihada. Let's take your questions, whether regarding this topic or any previous topic. In the last hadith, you mentioned that Prophet ﷺ was sent for the whole of mankind, and you clarified that he was also sent for the jinns. Since the mankind have the law of the sharia, which has been given to us by the Prophet, what law do the jinns have to follow? Do they have to follow any laws? Most likely, they follow the same law as we do. Because the Prophet was sent to them, the Qur'an was revealed to him and conveyed to them, as mentioned in the Qur'an, that we've revealed to you, O Prophet of Allah, that there were a number of jinn listening to you, and once they heard the message, they went back to their people and gave them da'wah. And then the Prophet ﷺ also met an envoy from the jinn, Nusaybin. And he spoke with them and he gave them what to eat and what not to eat. They requested, they requested halal meat. And the Prophet told them that every single bone you will find that was mentioned the name of Allah, which we eat and throw, you will find it as much as full of meat for you. And the dung of the animals would be the food for your animals. The dung we have from the animals, you know, from the cows, and etc. It would be the food for the animals of the jinn. So we believe that they have their own sharia, but is it exactly similar to us? This is something we cannot verify, and it is something that does not add value to us. See, always focus on the questions that get you closer to Allah. When someone says, the dog that was with the people in the cave, was it a German shepherd? Was it a Doberman? Was it a bulldog or a chihuahua? One would say, Akhi, why are you asking these questions? Would this draw us closer to Allah? When someone says that the star that Ibrahim saw, was it Venus, Mars, or any other planet? I don't, Allah did not tell us. Why should I pay any attention? The straws that Zachariah and his people threw so that they would take Maryam into their custody. What was it made of? Was it made of wood? Was it made of this? Was it made of that? All of this is irrelevant to us as Muslims. It doesn't draw you closer to Allah. Therefore, we refrain from asking questions that would not add value to us. Because this is the doing of the philosophers. They sit and say, uh, imagine that this is not water, it's tea. Yeah, but it is water. No, no, imagine if it's not so. And imagine if the tea is not green, it's black. <laughs> Why should I imagine this? I have enough problems to imagine. So such questions, we try our best to yani, uh, focus on what benefits us most. Any more questions? Yes, brother. If it once told Aisha Raziyallahu Anha that my eye sleeps but my heart doesn't sleep. A section of the people, they quote this uh, hadith by saying that the Prophet is still amongst us, by referring to this. This hadith was in a specific incident and that is when he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to sleep and then woke up and went to pray Fajr without performing wudu. And when Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, told him that, yani, I heard you snore, so how can you go and, and, and pray? He said, my heart does not sleep while my eyes sleep. This is 
while he's alive. But no one dares and say that the Prophet ﷺ did not die. Those who claim that the Prophet is alive in his grave and he hears us and he talks to us and not only that, they go the extra mile. They say he, they, he comes out and he goes and roams the whole universe and the earth and he listens to people and those who make mawlid, they have in their mawlid glasses of water and food. And when you ask him what is this, they say this is a blessed food because the Prophet comes and his spirit comes over it so we cure the ill with this food and this water. What is this? If you tell them that the Prophet died, no, he's not dead. He's alive in his grave. If he's alive in his grave, get him out. If he's alive, let's get him out. Can we get him out? No, 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 we can't. Why? If he's alive. He's not alive our life in the sense that he does not eat and drink and goes to the toilet and has intercourse with his wife. Because this is a life. But he is in a transitional period known as Al-Barzakh. And in Al-Barzakh, he's alive. He's enjoying paradise. He is having all the favors and blessings of Allah Azza wa Jal. He goes to the heavens, he goes to his grave. All of this is authentic and approved but we cannot say that he hears us or he knows what we're doing because he said in the highest degree and level of hadith which is known as mutawatir I will be the first to come to the hawd to the pond and there will come people of my followers from my ummah but the angels would reject them and I would complain Rabbi ummati ummati and they would tell me our Allah would tell me, you do not know, underline, you do not know what they have innovated after your death. And this is the punchline. You do not know, meaning when you were in your grave, you do not know what these people did. Why? Because you're dead. Allah says in the Quran, innaka mayyit, you are going to die and they are going to die as well. Therefore, we should make this clear. The Prophet died, alayhi salam. The companions washed him, the companions prayed funeral prayer, the companions buried him. So whoever claims that he's alive and he did not die is not a proper Muslim and Allah knows best. This is all the time we have until we meet next time. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.